Hi everyone, I'm Robin Doolittle from the Globe and Mail. I am here with former Toronto Mayor Rob Ford's third chief of staff, Mark Tuohy, who is about to publish a book on October 27th um, called Uncontrollable. Mayor Rob Ford, Uncontrollable. This week, McLean's ran an exclusive excerpt from that book. It's a pretty explosive passage. It's a conversation. Uh, Rob Ford has, has phoned you and he's having a domestic incident with his wife, Renata. Can you tell me what's going on in, in that scene? What happens is Rob Ford had a history of phoning staffers late at night. Um, as he went through his term, he would phone later and later at night to more and more staffers, and I was spared most of that until I became chief of staff, and then I had a number of calls from him. This was probably the most memorable one in my mind, and uh, one that I took very detailed notes through it because I felt that, well, one, I take notes on everything anyway, but uh, I felt right from very early in the phone call, as you can see when you read through the excerpt, that uh, I might have to remember this at some point for a witness statement or a police statement or something. He calls me at on my cell phone just before three o'clock in the morning. He's fairly incoherent when I pick up the phone. I can hear that he's having an argument with his wife. I can hear her in the background as well. And, uh, and for the most part, he's talking a little bit to me and a whole lot to her. Uh, but it's almost, the way he frames the call at the beginning is he wants me to witness through the phone that he's leaving the house. And so he's putting on a bit of a show for me. And my challenge throughout that whole phone call, which was terrifying at times, was to figure out how much of what he's saying is actually happening and how much of what he's saying is just frankly BS that he's putting on this show. And at one point he does talk about a gun. And obviously I'm concerned about that but he doesn't have the gun and I probe him immediately like what gun and he said well she took my gun and I'm thinking well he and I had talked about guns it had come up in conversation in the past and that there's more about that in the book but I didn't believe he had a gun in the house so that but when you say that you wonder and throughout every time he mentions it he kind of backs off well she took it she stole it well it's not here can't find it and so I spent most of that phone call listening with one hand, taking notes as I went through. On your child's construction on paper. On this construction paper that I grabbed off the kitchen table. And, uh, but also had my other phone sort of literally dialed into 911, wondering if it was going to cross the line to something that I would have to make a call. So writing this, you must have known that you would be asked at this moment, why didn't you call 911? I didn't call 911 because in my judgment, it never got to that point where it was actually a threat, where there was any peril. Do you think that you're just so used to this behavior that you didn't see that? Reading that as someone, There's I think a lot of people would read that and go, how could you not phone 911? There are children in the right. house. This is this is insane. A lot, a lot of people have already said that based on the excerpt. Mm -hmm. And taken in isolation, yeah, it, it, but it works both ways. And I'm not really sure, to be honest which, whether my judgment was skewed or whether the public's judgment is skewed, taken in isolation, yeah, it's a horrible thing. But actually, when you look at it, it's a, it's a husband and wife arguing. That happens every night in countless homes. So in your decision not to call 911, how much was going through your head about the fact that this is the mayor, if I call 911, this might get out, and maybe the next step is if I call 911 and this gets out, and he gets in trouble, I might not have a job. I don't think the latter part, uh, worrying about my job, entered into my mind at all. But what, what I am thinking about at that time is, I've called 911 50 times in my life, and I know exactly when I've done it and exactly why. And we never got there. Right? There, was, there was never in my mind an image. I know the conversation is horrible, and that's part of the reason why it's in the book, is to, to show the situation that, that we were operating and that he was operating, that the family was living through. And it's ugly, right? And other people may have made different decisions than I did, and that's fine. But it never got to that point of imminent peril. It just, it just didn't. I'm curious to hear why you felt that story needed to be mentioned now. The fact of the matter is that politicians are human, and what they do is often a reflection of where they come from. And I'm not sure where the line is between what's appropriate and what isn't appropriate in all cases. In this case, he eventually brought 
his illness, his addictions, into the workplace by having them affect how he did his job. I think it's important to understand why that happened. And frankly, I think it's important to understand why people didn't fully fathom earlier what was going on. Because there were so many other things going on at the same time. It, it wasn't easy in real time to figure out this is the problem. You know, this phone call that's excerpted in the magazine is sort of, it's a salacious piece to get people's interest, but it really isn't, uh, it isn't on its own reflective of everything that happened during that time. Right. But it was like, ah, now I understand how these dots connected. I didn't see that at the time.